Welcome to this week's podcast of Kicking It With Kidneys with your host, Cindy Barclay. Hey, Cindy, take it away. Hello, friends, and welcome to Kicking It With Kidneys, a forum to discuss topics important to the dialysis community and to provide a legitimate platform for those whose voices have historically been suppressed. In this episode, we will present part two of chronic kidney disease and its impact on vulnerable communities. We'll take a closer look at pre-renal screening, the five stages of renal failure, and how to prevent disease progression. Now, most folk believe that poor lifestyle practices and dietary noncompliance play a primary role in our inability to contain yet another healthcare disparity. Our panelists will continue to review, our, review the social and economic disparities that affect healthcare practices in the communities of color. And lastly, we'll share additional information on the financial burden of patients, their families, and the healthcare industry. To help explore these topics in more detail, uh, we'll introduce our panelists, Maria Jimenez, RN Administrator of Quality Dialysis, Rita Williams, Licensed Renal Social Worker, S. Scarborough, Master's in Business Administration and Entrepreneur, and B.J. Simone, Master's in Sociology and Health Services Researcher and Trainer. What's the word on the street, B.J.? Okay, thanks, Cindy. Our people on the street today are going to share some very personal insight. So let's pay close attention. Word on the street with Simone. Hey, Simone. We had it today talking to dialysis patients, and we asked them, how many years they had been on dialysis? What caused their kidneys to fail? And are they on the transplant list? Here's what they had to say. 18 diabetes entered into my kidneys and messed them up. No. I tried three times, but three times I failed. The diabetes had one time. When I tried, they found I had a hole in my toe. That failed me. And another time I went, I had uh, uh, my leg had a, a sore abrasion. That failed me. And the last time I checked, I, they said I had heart issues. That failed me. This is, this is um, June will be three years. Uh, I have scleroderma which is a um, autoimmune disease. No, not on the list. I also have lung disease uh, where I need a uh, double lung transplant. Also uh, in uh, heart failure. So until they get my heart stable, then I won't be able to get my lung and kidney transplant. Those were powerful answers and I know that it pulled at my heartstring when I first heard it so I think what we definitely hear is the struggle that these people and many others like them experience uh, in just trying to live with chronic kidney disease and um, I think that makes it more important that anything that we can do to help them and inform other patients in the public is really needed right now. Yes, I, I think I, I do agree with that. And to help us along in this process, uh, Maria, mm -hmm. can you give us a, a little bit more information on pregrenal and the five stages of chronic kidney disease? Sure. Um, as a first step, usually with diagnosing kidney disease, um, your doctor will discuss personal and familial history with you. Um, among other things, they may ask you if you've been diagnosed with high blood pressure, if you're taking any medications that may affect your kidney function, if you've noticed any changes in your urinary habits, and if you've had any family members um, that were diagnosed with kidney disease. Um, with this diagnostic testing, there are certain tests and procedures like blood tests, um, urine tests, imaging tests, uh, removing a sample from a kidney for testing, if that's um, necessary. Uh, but bringing in back last week, we had discussed the 
GFR. That is the glomerular filtration rate. And that is done with your labs based off of your age, race, gender, mm-hmm. things mm-hmm. of that nature. Um, so the GFR um, is a number based on your blood test for creatinine, um, which is a waste product in your blood. So when so when they do labs, so when your physician does the labs, uh, patients need to look at that number, that, that creatinine. To see what that Your is. primary care should be looking at that okay. as well. Pri- primary care physician. Correct, with okay. those lab works. Because when you're in the um, stages, there's a CKD 1 through 5, okay. um, stage 1 through 5. And that was created so that you can have a, a baseline of what part uh, that you're in in your disease process. Um, so starting with um, CKD stage 1, it's an early stage. Some people are a CKD Uh, Stage one and stage two are Mm -hmm. the early stages. And a lot of patients are not symptomatic at all. Um, But there can be signs of kidney damage if you're spilling protein in your urine Mm -hmm. or any physical damage to your kidneys, any trauma to your kidneys. So that's why it's important to follow up with your doctor, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, CKD stage three is actually broken up into two phases. Um, There's a stage 3A and a stage 3B which um, basically some of these patients still don't have any signs and symptoms, but if they do have signs and symptoms, you're considered a 3B stage. That's where you're going to have the swelling in your hands and the feet, Um, back pain, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. urinating Mm -hmm. more or less than normal. So is that when they start seeing the nephrologist or something? At this point, you're still with your primary care. Okay. Um, But once you get to stage three, and you become symptomatic, you should definitely visit uh, with the nephrologist. Okay. So what is that number? For that stage say, three, yeah. the G- GFR needs to be between 30 and 59. Okay. So when you say so GFR. So you go from higher numbers, your uh-huh. GFR starts at 90 and greater, mm-hmm. you're okay. But once mm-hmm. you hit that 90 mark and you start going down, that's when you're classified uh, with the sections of CKD. So CKD stage one is 90 or greater. CKD stage two is between 60 and 89. And as you progress down to CKD3, um, it's between 30 and 59. Now, CKD4, um, at this point, this needs to be taken very seriously. Um, This is the last stage before your kidneys are considered in failure, complete failure. Um, At this point, you still do have increased swelling, increased back pain, urination issues, um, blood pressures that are, you know, all out of range. Um, but at this point with CKD4, you should have already been with a nephrologist, actually have been partnered with a dietitian to help you with um, dietary changes as well. And at this point, you should be preparing for stage five, which is kidney failure, oh, wow. preparing for the ten- potential for dialysis or the potential for renal transplantation at that time. So the stages, Maria, do they, they're individualized as well as a patient. They don't go, I mean, what's the time? Is it a time span between stages? Well, it depends on what you do to, when you're in the early stages, what you're doing, what you're being proactive with doing to Ah. stop the stages from progressing. Okay. Um, So the patients need to be in there and taking care of their health and following directions from controlling the blood sugar. Even if it's bad at this point, with more control, you can slow or potentially stop your kidney disease process at that time. Uh, Blood sugars, um, making sure your blood pressure is under control, not smoking, eating healthier, uh, being active Mm -hmm. um, at least 30 minutes, five days a week and maintaining a healthy weight. As well. Okay. But by the time you reach CKD uh, five, stage five, your GFR is less than 15, which means it's time to start. So dialysis. you're saying out of 100. So let's just use an analogy. So I've got 100%. So you're saying that right now I'm using 100% of my kidneys. And when they diagnose me in stage five, then I'm at 15%. Correct. That, oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's alarming. You're feeling terrible. Your mm-hmm. blood is not being cleaned. You're swollen. Mm-hmm. You've gained tons of not body weight, but literal fluid weight. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you know, when you touch on your skin and you you hold you, you mash it down on your feet or your ankles um, and you still see your fingerprint there. It causes you to retain a lot of fluid because your kidneys are not functioning. So stage five and in stage renal disease are used, the terminology is used interchangeably? Correct. ESRD is at stage five. In stage renal disease means you're 
on dialysis. Okay, well, is it possible for me to be in stage five and be cured? There's something that's called acute renal failure. Okay. Um, to where you may have to be in stage five, start dialysis, but we're monitoring your functions, monitoring your labs, monitoring your fluid intake and all that good stuff to see if there's a potential for, for, for recovery. Right. And sometimes there are. What is the probability? Is it high or low or like next to none? It depends on the reason why you started dialysis. Okay. There's sometimes okay. there's trauma mm-hmm. where the kidneys are just shot based off of medications that they gave you in the hospital at that time. And there's mm-hmm. no chance for renal recovery. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times if you've got the diabetes and the hypertension, um, slowing that will mm-hmm. slow the process or reverse the process. It, mm-hmm. c- it could. If you see your doctor and do what you're supposed right. to Compliance do. Compliance is key. Compliance is the key. Rita, so... We talked a lot about African Americans, right? You know, since they're the primary shareholders in all of this, right? Okay? We're right behind it's, it's, you guys. We're, <laughs> we're buying up community. Okay, let's talk so, about your 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 sure, Latinos definitely. and your. As we know, the Latino community comp, uh, is one of the largest minority groups in the United States. They, you know, it's a high burden of uh, chronic kidney disease. I mean. We have a lot of sugar diabetes. We have a lot of high blood pressure right behind every other minority as well. We're really making strides, I guess. We're catching up. (laughs) We're catching up. But there is a difference for minority treatments. I was reading some of the research, and the research has shown that those with medical insurance, Mm -hmm. you know, they Mm -hmm. may have medical Mm -hmm. insurance. Mm -hmm. There's a delay in services as well, like Maria was talking about. Did you know that only 10% of the patient population that's on dialysis have an actual health health insurance. That's right. That's right. A commercial Only, insurance. Commercial insurance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Once Only they 10%. get into dialysis, then we can start doing those applications and assisting them to get Medicare. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It is true, and that's what you know. Twenty five percent of Latinos have regular a uh, health care provider. Like mm-hmm. Maria was saying, that PCPs. A yes. lot of the Latino community does not go to their PCP to begin with for basic. Healthcare, yeah. and then they start noticing, like you said, the swelling and all that kind of stuff, and they're like, "What's going on?" You know, they haven't been taking care of their diabetes. They haven't been taking care of their, you know, high blood pressure. Well, let's so, talk about resources, then. Okay. Well, yeah. and some of that is that some people have insurance, like you said, ten mm-hmm. percent. Mm-hmm. A lot of them are underinsured, though. Even if they do have that insurance, they're underinsured. By that you mean. Well, it's not enough. Some of it covers some part of renal, and and some of what it is, a lot of our patients can't afford the co-pays that go along with this insurance. Mm-hmm. You know, to see a nephrologist, that's a specialty. It may be a higher copay. Mm-hmm. It may mm-hmm. be $50 instead of the 25 or the 10 or whatever that, you know, specialties are always higher copays. So, you know, if you're choosing between going to see a specialist and seeing your regular doctor, you mm-hmm. may want your PCP to care for that. We know that's not a good idea. Uh, yeah. The yeah. idea is to go on to that nephrologist mm-hmm. and start following all of that. A lot of things also that we found was that... Um, the, like I said, they don't have the money for those medical tests Maria was talking about. The treatments, maybe there is something they could do, you know, different medications and stuff they can be on to be with the high blood pressure and the sugar diabetes to mm-hmm. bring those down mm-hmm. so we don't progress through the stages as fast. I right. mean, or stop it. Right. You said they could stop it, right? At the one generational point. curses again. Yeah. Here we right. go. Yeah. Generational curses. Yeah. So it's like, well, my mother had it. I'm going to have it. Why am I taking all these pills or going to see all these specialists? But, you know, uh, of course, some of the social factors are the poverty, the economic instability, the limited to health insurance, mm-hmm. uh, communication mm-hmm. barriers. Yes, yes. I mean, yes. even with your primary care doctors, a lot of people that only speak Spanish, the primary care doctors don't speak Spanish. And once again, we have to use the translators, and sometimes things get lost. So, BJ, tell me, mm-hmm. can you uh, are you aware of any healthcare uh, initiatives in the communities that would improve the outcome of uh, this disease and disease awareness? Well, yes. Um, you know, we we touched on so many things in, in our last episode, um, but I wanted to start by looking at national healthcare initiatives. And I got this idea from something that Sarita said. Um, So it was very interesting to find that the Office of Minority Health 
which is under the Department of Health and Human Services, okay. um, actually has the prevention of kidney disease listed as one of their uh, specific focus areas for the fiscal year 2020. 2021. Mm -hmm. um, now, I don't know how this is going to translate into real world application, but it's good to know that at least it's on a national agenda. And one of the other things that they included as one of their priorities was cultural competence okay. Um, okay. among healthcare providers nationwide. And that was something that Maria and Rita alluded to last time. Uh, when they were talking about the challenges of constantly talking and educating patients, and it doesn't seem to be working, um, making a point with them. They don't seem to get it. You know, they're not connecting the dots. So I was thinking that maybe there is a better way to get the message out in communities of color. Um, and this is something that I would like to just really explore with the group. In, uh, in a little bit more detail. Okay. I, and I also read some of that uh, of research as well, and it did talk about how a big part that the PCP doctor does play in that, encouraging mm -hmm. the minority community to mm -hmm. get the pre-screenings and stuff like that. And also that building that relationship, you know, because some of the, 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 diag the signs are, you know, a lower back pain mm -hmm. can mimic mm -hmm. other things, but, mm -hmm. you know, to start thinking and bringing forefront that kidney care is very prominent in minorities. Yes, yes, yeah. it is. Yes, so it is. being culturally competent about our ailments as well. Well, Maria, you've worked with a lot of these patients, and basically what I've seen as I've worked with them as well is that um, sometimes they are very complacent. Do you see a lot of that? Oh, a lot. How are we going to change one's thought processes? How are we going to get you rejuvenated and recharged to take care of yourself and to understand that the benefits and the organizations that are around now uh, that are attempting to help you may not be here in the future? Well, it, it definitely is a challenge because um, you still have patients that are, you know, CKD stage five on dialysis and they're still not compliant. Um, so it's just going to take education that's ongoing. We just continue to, you know, to press forward and you can't hit them all, but we can hit most. We can attempt to hit most as far as education and slowing this process. Um, but it is it is a lot of um, just this is just the way things have been being complacent. Like Rita said, my grandmother had this and this is now it's just my time right. when it doesn't have to be. Right. right, And I think like Maria is saying, I think we have to individualize that. And we have yes. that opportunity sometimes to do that. I mean, yeah, we're talking about phosphorus overall, but we're talking about you, Mr. Jones. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. what is affecting you. This yes. is what it's doing to your body. And your siblings. And your siblings. And your children. Yeah. You know. Well, the, the company Quality Dialysis is a little bit different. Right. Um, you know, than your, most of your in-centers. Um, where they're just like ran it like cattle. By the time you put a patient you on, you haven't you said had that enough correctly, time. correctly, Maria. <laughs> I mean, there is no individuality yeah, sometimes. You haven't had enough time to do as much education and reach as much. But, you know, with individualized home programs, mm -hmm. um, like with quality dialysis, you have that one-on-one -on -one time where you can make a difference yeah. with those patients. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I was thinking about, uh, <clears throat> when, when I was working with Native American communities, um, while we talk about the breakdown of the family unit in um, many minority groups, right. I think there is still a traditional practice of giving respect and deference to elders. Very true. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I just want to share uh, an example of what we did. There was a family and there was issues within the family dynamic of there being one caregiver who was in conflict with the other family members. Okay. And she was providing the care, but because, you know, there was this sort of infighting, then the patient wasn't being compliant with the things that mm -hmm. they needed to do. They were continuing to, to drink and, and some other things that, mm -hmm. that was mm -hmm. causing all kinds of crisis. What we did is we looked at the matriarch of that family. That's right. And mm -hmm. we said, let's talk to the matriarch. Because getting the family to listen to 
healthcare providers and, and someone from the outside just isn't going to be effective enough. And we talked to her, which is not unlike what you guys are saying, you know, really helping them understand what the, the impact this is to the rest of the family. So we talked to her and she actually talked to the family and they gave her the difference and, and we were able to at least get some progress in that family. So that's a great maybe idea. that is yeah, something that we idea. need to think of. The, the issue that I also find with that is when I work with the VA is you got, you know, there's money. There always comes yeah. down to money. And, and Maria was saying, you don't always have the time. Well, time is money. Yes. And so then the question is, how do you allot that time for education, particularly if it's not the, directly to the family? How does that time get compensated? Well, so those are things that you have to think about, too. That's yeah. true. And education, I mean, a dialysis unit, the average dialysis unit, not our home program, but the average dialysis unit, I mean, those nurses are very busy, very, you know, mm -hmm. so it's supply and demand. So right. you finish with one shift, it's another shift. So there mm -hmm. may be some deficits there. Uh, I mm -hmm. think that they are. Um, ESRD, in stage renal disease, is a life-threatening disease, but it has mm -hmm. significant economic sustainability, of which minorities have, a, have very little economic presence. Now, what I mean by that is that there is not enough of us to control um, in control, okay, in the administrative role in our businesses. There are very few of us in the position to make major decisions regarding the funds that are used that are associated with this disease. So, Sarita, let's bring you in. Okay, well, I think <laughs> all of you guys have been talking about money. Um, I've heard co-pays, I've heard insurance, um, a number of different things that you guys have said around the table today all come back to the money. And that's why I always mm -hmm. say it always starts with the money or stops with the money. Right. Um, I did a little research this weekend because I wanted to really break some things down. And so the first question I asked was, how many dialysis centers are in the United States? 7,500 or so? 7,566. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Wow. Of that, your top two organizations, they represent 72% of the business. Mm -hmm. If we if we broke that down, you would be talking about 5455 freestanding facilities. Mm. Now let's let's get to the money. Okay. Just these two <laughs> organizations for FY 2020 grossed 31 billion $959 million for one year. Right. Well, they wouldn't be able to gross that, Sarita. Let me just play the devil's advocate, okay? Mm -hmm. They wouldn't be able to gross that if we did better within our communities, okay? You know, I mean, the businesses... But since we're businesses. not, let's pick up the coins where we can get them. That's right. And that actually also represents. No, you didn't come to me, Maria. <laughs> Facts. Facts. That represented a 5.6 increase in revenue from 2019. Now, Rita, should we keep her or put her off the show? Cause she doesn't. She, no, <laughs> we're going to keep her. Okay. She's, she's exposing people out. and got, she's checking the Cindy. Okay. Check it no. out. Right, we're talking about this 31 billion <laughs> caring for 554,038 people on an annual basis nationwide. And that does not include your transplantations. So, okay. so you're talking about this, that 90K a year that most people don't even make. That's correct. Okay? That most people don't even make 90K a year yeah. that we're spending that patients may not be getting the best information. They may not be understanding what they need to do with their families. They may not be able to, you know. If, if, they're, if Medicare is paying for it, it's not their money. Mm -hmm. Oh, but it is their money. I it, it might be yours, but it may not be theirs. Well, I like to think that they, at some point in time in their life span, paid into the Medicare system. Well. So are you saying that that was then and this is now? Yes. Okay, but go on. Continue. <laughs> now, the, the, the other thing I want to point out is when you talk about uh, minorities having a bigger share, I didn't do a total sum, but... In, just the voice. In, you know, I, I'm just talking about a little seat at the table. Well, I'm talking about the money. Okay. I'd like a piece mm -hmm. of the pie, too. Mm -hmm. but And ice cream. 
<laughs> but what we what we find if we use what we call supply chain management, okay, and we mm-hmm. talk about who is all involved in the process of dialysis from start to finish. Mm-hmm. Now I did a partial listing, and I came up with about twenty different individuals. Mm-hmm. You're talking about insurance companies, mm-hmm. general practitioners, nephrologists, billers, coders, collection mm-hmm. agencies, um, marketing and advertising. At the higher level, at the federal level, you're talking about lobbyists. Mm-hmm. I want dialysis mm-hmm. patients to really listen to that because yeah. these are all the people <clears throat> that are uh, recipients of funds. Right. Okay. And, and they probably don't even know that. But hit that again for me. Well, I'm just I'm just naming a few. Your lobbyists, your lawyers, your technology, your IT people that put the software and the systems together that are required by CMS to be able to do the reporting. Mm-hmm. You're talking about your transportation, your accountants, your distributors. Oh, and let's not forget your pharmaceuticals, your manufacturing Big of time. the machines. Mm-hmm. And Big so time. now we go back to your question, where is it? that people of color, and I'm not saying that Mm -hmm. all people of color do not have skills, Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. when we look at it and we go back to the educational model, and I'll leave that for BJ's plate over there, Mm -hmm. but (laughs) we we don't have those skill sets. That's why there's such an emphasis on teaching children the STEM, the science, technology, math now, and the E represents something. Um, But this is why we are not at the table and now why we are not getting a piece of the pie. But what I hear also, Sarita, is that, you know, after you really talk about all the people that are profiting from kidney disease, that it's a business. It is. That. It is. It is a it is business. That. It's a business. Even the nephrologists and, have uh-huh. become yeah. businessmen. Instead of doing what's best interest for the patient based off of modalities, they're educating mm-hmm. them on modalities that's going to put money in their pocket. Well, right. so you say, Maria. I mean, Rita, what are you well, supposed to do? Now, that's what Maria says. Okay. But what do you say? Do, I, are, aren't you supposed to give them a list, Rita? Yes. You're supposed to give them a list. Of- we always give them choices, but when they're all kind of thinking the same thing. Mm. Well, I do give choices. Always, our patients always have a choice. I'm going to have to agree with Maria, and this is yeah. why. When we look at dialysis, we don't look at it as a system. Mm-hmm. No. Dialysis is mm-hmm. a system, just like the political system, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the criminal mm-hmm. justice system. They're all systems. Mm-hmm. And so there's nothing wrong with the dialysis system. The, mm-hmm. the goal is to offer at least a base level of care. Right set by the federal government and the networks as to what the standards are, and then to monetize the patients. And by that, I mean monetizing, you're making money off of them. There has to be some level of profit. Yeah, but Sarita, you know what? I have seen many physicians try to get patients involved in their care in the form of patient care conferences. They're not available for that. You know, well, Cindy, you know our patients have to work. I mean, they can't always be ready for those patient conferences. Or, I mean, it's not always possible. I, I mean, know, again, I know you. We want mm-hmm. We want this care to be patient center based. Yes, 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 and, yes, and yes. We do because we all want to have a part in their care and stuff. And sometimes the patient's just not available because you know I have to work to keep that insurance up. So what you're saying is that the doctor has to make allowances for his time. That, that's right. Or the patient mm-hmm. has to look. Yeah. Oh, my if goodness. So that's a tough decision. Pay, yeah. That's a tough decision. Well, you know, also, I think there's one of, you know, we, we mentioned this in an earlier episode when we talk about, unfortunately, racist attitudes. Sometimes people go into a uh, care provider and they look at them and they just automatically assume there's no point in me spending any time telling you what Very to do because you're not going to do it. Very and true. that was something that Maria said in our last episode. She said, you know, it's not always about education because she has people who don't, you know, she has patients who aren't highly educated, but she said they see the light That's right. and they tend to be more compliant. And you have other people who, you know, don't necessarily fit that criteria right. and they don't. But it's the experience. And I think since we are talking about, um, people in communities of color, this is something that they face. They are herded in. There is this, this 
attitude that, you know, why should I spend time? You're not going to do it anyway. And they don't. I, I've been with doctors and they spend less than five minutes with me. They come in. But that's what you allow your and, doctor to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. You, you, granted. Yeah. But, but well, Maria, you didn't, how BJ, many people, I remember that situation. You didn't allow your doctor to do that. I remember. Well, you no, the I don't. Go, but yeah. but <laughs> I'm saying the fact is so many people do, because in my working with um, with patients, right. when I worked at the VA, I saw how there is this this attitude that medical professionals are God, particularly doctors. Right. They're, they're gods and, the and you don't question them. Yeah, and but you no. don't question them. Even if they're telling you something that flies in the face of that doesn't seem right. Mm-hmm. You may not know what's wrong with it, but it doesn't seem right. You know, maybe yeah. tell me what else I can do. And so, yeah, I think we can't ignore that as being something that people of color face no. to their detriment. I think the flip side of that, though, too, is that mm-hmm. the population that we're talking about in many cases. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. They don't know what questions to ask a doctor. Right. I right. I often have, I call a friend of mine who happens to be a nurse. And mm-hmm. I'll say, well, what does this mean? Right. You know, the doctor yes. has a way of explaining things that are not in lay terms. Vacuum. To vacuum, like in the vacuum. People. Yeah. And so yes. over they a period of time, they're going to get desensitized and just yeah. be like, Okay, let me let let me let them say what they're gonna say, and then I'm gonna go home and still do what I knew because I That's didn't understand right. what he or she said oh, to begin looking, with. You're looking right. for someone to translate what the doctor said. Yes, yeah, you're yeah. still walking right. out with a nurse saying, and the, the doctor. Well, say a lot this? of those, a lot of the people in the doctor's offices are not nurses. That's right. You know, you're, you're they, right. Yeah, so you're they right. don't have the knowledge. That's right. Um, to kind of you know, so is it is it so so is it is it my responsibility for my lack of knowledge? Is that what you're saying, Sarita? My being the patient? Yes. To a certain extent, yes. Because we we you know, and I don't I don't wanna just really get but down. But if I to don't the know bottom. what to ask, then why do, why isn't it, why well, isn't there some type of comprehensive course? I think of people comprehensive. find out what they want to find out. Well, I want to know everything about my well, kids. Well, sometimes at these doctors' offices it's like the blind leading the blind, Cindy. And sometimes you don't even see a doctor. You may go see. two or three appointments and see a practitioner, the practitioner or, or someone PA. else. And then the doctor comes in once a month and says something to you and is out the door and writes on his chart, sends it over to the biller and the coder and says, I visited with uh, mm-hmm. Miss Scarborough yeah. today. But there's mm-hmm. access to information. Again, we are in the age of technology. That's true. And whether it's good information or bad information, the information is there. What are we doing with it? Well, I think you missed the first episode. If you ever want to keep a secret, put it in a book. <laughs> 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 but what about the, 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 the population of people that are not technologically savvy? Okay. I mean, my generation, I've had to come up to speed. Okay. But mm-hmm. there are a lot of people in my generation, computers. You know, I mean, they, they sit, they'll watch television, but they're not very versed on the language. They don't know a lot about computers, mm-hmm. Maria. You're young, you're energetic, you know. You were brought up on computers, were you not? Yes, I was. Okay. So what do I do with my generation? How do I get them? I think it is back to the healthcare professionals. Yeah. It's back to mm-hmm. us. We need it's to back assess to the community centers. The, yes, and yeah, the- yeah. And we need to us- that- assess their knowledge when you first see these patients to know that. I mean, as as an experienced nurse, I know when somebody's under. I can I can look at the nonverbal communication right. and know when somebody is getting it and when they're not, and not just push them aside and say I trained them and that was it. You know, right. we, we've got to do better. I think. Well, I but think I, we have to hold people accountable. If it's our PCPs, then we need to hold mm-hmm. our PCPs accountable. Mm-hmm. I mean, if that is who my contact person is, because you know we're working with insurance and we're working mm-hmm. with money. If the, my PCP is supposed to manage my care then why doesn't he have all this education available to me? Well, and I think well, one the of other... the initiatives... Okay. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to One say... of the initiatives that um, is, is being bantered about is to establish more community health right. representatives. Yes. Right. Yes. And particularly in minority communities, right. I think that that's going to be very useful. Well, I heard about that community, uh, that, that those initiatives, mm-hmm. like uh, I think mm-hmm. CVS is one of the places to where... They're 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 saying they're getting involved more in community uh, outreach. Mm-hmm. However, 
how many CVSs or Walgreens but, or any of those places are in our communities. So in other words, they're we're there reaching out to because you. Because we are on medications. They're mm-hmm. there. Right. We're yeah. on medications. They're making money. They're in the they're in the hood. They're in they're the hood. in our neighborhood. Okay, hood. well, I'm I'm going down to the hood next week and check that out. They're there. Okay, they're there. Stop All by right. and wave at me. Oh, oh, you're in the hood too. I'm in the okay. hood too. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the only thing I wanted to add to that though is that mm-hmm. um what I understand about dialysis is that part of the 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 glue that's missing is the family involvement. Mm-hmm. When you talk mm-hmm. about the seniors, now let's just use for example if I had a grandparent that was on dialysis, he or she may not be able to use the technology, but you would think somewhere between me and my siblings or my parents, there would be some kind of way to support that. I mean, when a person gets to be a certain age, they don't take themselves to the doctor. They rely on others. They right. rely on others. And it's usually a family yeah. person. Right. So I often found myself going to the doctor with a family member. Right. And then when we got home, I'd have to explain, well, you're supposed to take this so many times a day. These are the consequences. If you take this incorrect, they just don't know. So when we're dealing with seniors, we're dealing with a special group of people that are unlike the ones 65 and above. Mm-hmm. Right. And mm-hmm. I think that's where you have to yeah. get more family we've involvement. we talked about the family unit or the family network mm-hmm. or whatever, but we see it breaking down. Yes. I mean, grandmother's 35 years old. Yeah. I met a grandmother the other day, 35 years old. Okay. What is she going to be able to? She was busy. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> what? What did she say? What did she, she got to do? What? Scarborough said she was busy. Isn't that horrible? <laughs> okay. So you <laughs> said she was 35 year old grandmother. Yeah, yeah. 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 They're getting younger and younger. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, so we have a lot of deficits. And, and, and our job is to educate our renal patients, but there are so many problems within our community, Sarita, as you know. And and, and how do you make money again? Po folks, right? Mm-hmm. And most poor folks are who? People of color. People of color. Right. But it doesn't say that the system is not working. Okay. That, that actually is the whole point. Okay. The system is designed to make money off of people. Mm-hmm. And that's what we talk about the monetization. Correct. In this particular mm-hmm. example, it just happens to be people who are poor and people who are of color. Right. Mm-hmm. But as you said, it is a business. And maybe part of the mission in, in helping our communities is helping people understand that just because the business exists doesn't mean you have to be a willing patron of it. That's right. That's right. Well, we have to kind of wrap the show up. Okay. So let's get some final <laughs> thoughts. We're going to start with Rita. Okay. So I think be a voice for yourself. We need to empower Mm -hmm. our communities to be a voice for themselves. Speak out. If something's not right, make the change. All right. Maria. All right. I just uh, think an important thought or thing to remember is that with chronic kidney disease, your kidneys do not usually fail all at once. Um, It's Mm -hmm. a disease process that is very slow um, and often over a period of years. So that's good news about the disease process. And you can catch it early with medications as well, lifestyle changes, um, and helping slow its pre- progression um, will keep you feeling your best as long as possible. So s- stop the bleeding. Mm. Mm, I like that. DJ. Um, well, I think my final thought for, for today would be uh, to find ways to promote that education. We talk about communication. I think working with finding more effective ways to communicate in the uh, in communities of color, that we can't say one size fits all. That's there right. are specific things that we really need to target for minority groups that don't necessarily translate to other groups. Well said. Sarita, <laughs> you're smiling. <laughs> well, of course, I'm going to always take a different approach, but I'd, I'd like to see minorities become more involved in the process of the the technology side Mm -hmm. or the business side of Mm -hmm. dialysis. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. we have to, we have to create ways to train individuals. I mean, it could be as simple as a a lab technician Mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. an LVN doesn't, but that's the way we start making 
money from the system. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and sometimes when we have people that are working with us that look like us, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. then we may be a little more inclined to listen to mm-hmm. the things that the nurses and the social workers are saying. But, you know, if it's just somebody that can't relate, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. when, I, when I'm just out and about in a neighborhood, you know, I, I may not be at the same level as the other person, mm-hmm. but we share the same experiences and backgrounds. And I think that makes mm-hmm. a big difference. But I think corporate America has got a handle on what you just said, because in most of these dialysis facilities, they're black, it's black representation and Latino. The nurses are black. Okay. Uh, the social and workers, lots dietitian. Of, uh, Dialysis units. Yes, in the there are lots of them. Okay, but, but in the those units, is, they're using but, technicians mm-hmm. more so than RNs, right? Which means they're at the lower portion of the pay scale. Back and to not, capitalism. Back to capitalism. That's right. We need more nurses. Just and we need more nurses positioned in those units to teach. You see what I'm trying to say? But nobody wants to spend money because that's revenue that's pulling out of one's pocket. That's and correct. And I think that's what what we need to do. I like that analogy. Well, let me leave a final thought with you. No one needs to spend time making excuses for our past. We need to participate in the decision-making to guarantee our future. Well, uh, that's it. Uh, You guys want to say bye or whatever? Bye, guys. Okay. Bye. All right. See you Uh, next time. (laughs) Okay. So join us next week where we'll be talking about uh, the economic impact of SALT. Okay, we hope you've enjoyed our show and we look forward to you joining us next week on another segment of Kicking It with Kidneys. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Kicking It with Kidneys with your host, Cindy Barclay. See you next week. The views expressed on this podcast are educational and opinion based. These are not medical doctors.